What was the sea monster that attacked and mauled this American warship? Did a giant octopus as big as Piccadilly Circus come ashore on this beach? Did the legendary serpent of the sea appear to this Cornish fisherman? Out come the head, about three feet away from the body. Had a good look at us. Presumably it didn't like to look away and he just, he just disappeared, smirched. Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communication satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, after a lifetime of science, space and writing, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. I'm standing in front of my bungalow on the extreme southern tip of Sri Lanka. Just over 100 years ago, according to the London Times, which is not prone to sensational reporting, a schooner, the Pearl, of 150 tons, sailed from Gaul Harbor, which is the next bay to here. That schooner sailed past here into the Bay of Bengal. And there, she was attacked and sunk by a giant squid. This was observed from a P&O liner, which rescued some of the survivors from the schooner. It's an incredible story, but when one considers the enormous amount of unexplored ocean, there are 6,000 miles of empty sea from here to the icy walls of Antarctica. One can believe that out there lurked unknown and perhaps gigantic monsters still unknown to science. The late Lieutenant R. E. Grimani Cox was returning home to England in 1942 when he encountered one of the Second World War's most nightmarish sea stories. His troop ship was sunk by a German raider in the South Atlantic. Cox found himself on a fragile raft beset by sharks. After five days came a sinister assault. Cox showed the evidence later to a friend. Well, when I looked at his leg, he pulled up his trousers and I could see scars the size of a penny, which is about an inch and a quarter of the old penny, were, were dotted at intervals all the way up his leg. And these were white scars sunk quite deep into the flesh where the skin had been pulled off. Before he died in 1971, Cox told the story to his sisters, as well as to his friend, a biologist, Professor Cloudsley Thompson. Yes, he didn't, well, he didn't show me that. He only showed me the... Well, he was, well, he was you were his sisters, and he was, this was in the mess. There were 12 of them on the raft initially, and only three survived to the end of the five days. And one of the most horrifying things that happened while they were lying there, dying one by one from thirst, was one evening when they were attacked by a giant squid. An enormous shape appeared beside the raft, and a huge arm came over and snatched one of the men and tore him off the raft before anybody could do anything to save him. And presumably he was eaten. And they were still barely recovering from the shock of this when another arm or tentacle came over the side of the raft. He saw it silhouetted against the, the, the starlit sky and it fastened itself on him round his leg and round his body, particularly his right leg, because that's where the sc scars mainly were that he showed me, but I believe he said that they were on the rest of his body as well. And he'd have been pulled off just like the others, only fortunately by that time people were alert and so they grabbed on and held him. And instead of him being pulled over the side, the suckers pulled lumps of skin off him, off his body. And this is what caused these massive number of scars all over him. On her maiden voyage out of San Diego, the US Navy frigate Stein also had a weird encounter. The Stein's anti-submarine sonar gear suddenly went US, unserviceable. She sailed home. 
Once the family reunions were over and the ship was in dry dock, Petty Officer Ira Carpenter went down to examine the underwater dome. We noticed that there were some, some uh, quite long scratches starting from the uh, front and the side and down underneath the dome itself. The longest one, I would say, was about four feet long. At the bottom of each one of these cuts, or at least 90% of the cuts, was something embedded underneath the rubber coating itself. <clears throat> of course, I was interested to determine what that was. It was I had never seen anything like this uh, before. Uh, this type of damage was brand new to me. So I used my knife to pick out one, uh, this foreign object underneath the uh, no-file coating. And it looked to me like it was a claw. And I quipped to my ASW officer at the time. I said, look here, it looks like we have been ta attacked by uh, uh, bunch of uh, small alligators. Navy biologist F.G. Wood. This is a small piece of the no-foul covering that was taken from the sonar dome of this ship. In many of these cuts were found teeth or claws, such as this one. And it's apparent that whatever did this damage grasped the dome and ripped all the way through this rubber covering to the metal below. The claw <clears throat> it looked like it had been wrenched out of whatever had put it there. I think that it must be from a squid because squids do have claws or hooks similar to this. Nothing else that is known in the ocean has structures of this kind. This doesn't rule out something that we haven't found yet because undoubtedly there are creatures in the sea that are not yet known to science. The Stein has since remained unscathed. But although no full-grown giant squid has ever been caught, a hint of what such creatures may be like seems to surface oddly about every 30 years in the far north, in the cold waters of the Labrador Current. This is St. John's, Newfoundland, the wartime convoy base on Canada's Atlantic coast and headquarters for Dr. Frederick Aldrich and his team. This is a giant squid of the species Archituthus ducks. It came ashore on November the 22nd, 1979 at St. Brendan's on Collier's Island in Bonavista Bay, Newfoundland. It's an immature female. It is a small female, but it is a giant squid. During World War II, as ships would leave the harbor, they would be torpedoed by submarines and when the survivors would go over the sides and hit the life rafts, giant squid would uh, surface, pull them off of the rafts, and take them to their death under the surface. I cannot help but speculate that what we know about squid and the, its attraction to red, I just wonder uh, if the uh, red life jacket of the traditional Mae West life jacket might not have been a contributing factor in the death of those uh, seamen. These are typical suckers on an arm of the giant squid. And you'll see that in addition to the suction cup, each sucker is fitted with a ring of teeth so that when this sucker is applied to either prey or predator, these teeth are set and anchored into the flesh at the same time that the suction cup makes contact uh, with the flesh of the other animal. The entrance to the mouth is guarded by these large beaks, much like the beaks of a parrot, and they tear pieces off of the prey or the predator, as the case may be. The tongues and the lips of sperm whales bear sucker scars, which are approximately 12 inches in diameter. I believe that giant squid reach an approximate maximum size of something like 150 feet. If this is 20 feet long, uh, well, then um, it's uh, almost uh, eight times longer than this in overall length, and that's a big squid. Now that we know that the giant squid is attracted to red, I'm making sure that my equipment is an appropriate color, yellow. 
Whatever size giant squid may reach, it does now seem that there really are giant octopuses, and that this man, Professor Joseph Gennaro of New York University, has evidence that one came ashore on this Florida beach in 1896. It was a local doctor, DeWitt Webb, who took charge of the carcass at Anastasia Beach, St. Augustine. He and his helpers had to use four horses plus three sets of blocks and tackle to move the body, six tons or more, up the beach. The mere stump of the one remaining tentacle was truly awesome, 32 feet long. Perhaps an effective example of the size of the octopus which might be represented by Webb's find would be to first look at the common octopus in this position and realize that Webb's octopus would actually stretch tip to tip from here to the red car up the beach. Part of the material eventually landed in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. And all that remains of the octopus of the deep is this piece of tissue. Notice that it is sinewy and fibrous in its structure, something in the nature of beef or soup meat. When I examined these tissues, I found that that pattern looked at in the polarizing light of the polarizing microscope was most similar to that of the true octopus. All this gives me strong reason to believe that what Dr. Webb found was indeed a gigantic specimen of octopus. Almost every year, surprising discoveries are made in the ocean. As recently as 1976, the US Navy accidentally dredged up a totally unknown and quite large shark, the ferocious looking megamouth, weighing almost a ton. And for centuries, there have been reports of the so-called great sea serpent. Scores of captains have recorded such sightings in their ship's logs. And no skipper makes an entry in his log without a very good reason. This happened to a Norwegian ship, and this was the monster reported by HMS Daedalus. The crew of the city of Baltimore saw the head of a serpent in the Gulf of Aden, and the bowsprit of the British banner was chewed up by a serpent in 1860. The only systematic attempt to analyze reports of the sea serpent has been launched by two Canadian scientists, John Seibert and Paul Leblanc. They've concentrated on the coastal waters off Vancouver. Dozens of sightings were reported. There were at least 25 of them who uh, would describe species not really known to, uh, to marine biology. Seashelt, a 30-minute flight north of Vancouver, is the location of yet another report needing investigation. A local boy, John Andrews, was fishing off a pier when his sighting occurred. Could you tell us exactly what it looked like? I guess it looked pretty much like a, a long snake-like thing with fins on it. And at first sight of it, I saw a head about a foot and a half long, about eight, nine inches wide. And it had large cat-like eyes, and uh, they reflected light like a cat's, and they could move in opposite directions. One was looking at me and one at the bottom. And then, it, and then I noticed that it was, oh, thickness of my thigh, almost a foot around. The body of the animal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the body itself. And it was, after it had swum underneath me, I noticed it was probably about 40 or 50 feet long. Did it have fins? Yeah, it had uh, two in the front, two in the back, and it swam undulated, like up and down, instead of uh, side to side, and it swam right under me. It's difficult to say what kind of creature John saw. It certainly doesn't match well with any kind of known mammal or any kind of known fish, for that matter. The uh, long snake-like body suggests that it's not a mammal, but its uh, up and down uh, undulation motion is typically mammalian. Uh, we uh, found that there were about 
three main categories of strange animals which had been reported. One of them was serpentine, of the kind that John Andrews described to us. Uh, there was another one with a long neck and rather coarse uh, hair of like coconut fibers, as it was described by one witness. And a third category also had a, a long neck, but was sometimes mentioned to have a mane, and sometimes also mentioned to have horns, with a head looking like that of a sheep or like that of a giraffe. None of the witnesses in the survey were professional artists. But it's clear enough from the drawings in their questionnaires what they thought they saw. This is John Andrew's sketch of his sighting. Margaret Stout saw this in 1961, and David Miller saw this creature off Discovery Island. But it may be that the body of such a sea monster has fallen into the hands of man. In September 1977, this Japanese fishing boat was off the east coast of New Zealand when it trawled up in its nets a mystifying carcass. The Japanese TV networks were excited enough to helicopter teams out over the South Pacific and winch their reporters down onto the ship at sea. On the deck of the Zuyo Maru, the skipper talked to journalists. On April the 25th at about 10.30, we noticed something big caught in the nets. It was a red, fleshy object which smelled very strongly. We didn't know what it was, so I went for my camera and flash gun. Sadly, the body itself was afterwards thrown back. But early in 1980, one of the world's leading fisheries experts, Professor Fujio Yasuda, arrived for a conference in London with such evidence as remains. This is all the evidence about the unknown creature dredged from the sea by the Zuyo Maru off New Zealand on the 25th of April 1977. These photographs were taken by Mr. Yano of Taiyo Fisheries. The real half of the body was rotten and dropped off. As you can see in this photograph, the surface of the body is covered with a fat-like substance. This is the drawing made by Mr. Yano after measuring the creature. I can't think of any known fish which has this shape. I can't tell what this creature is, but I assure you that it is completely unknown to us. But sea monsters don't only materialize in the remote oceans. In 1976, just 30 miles off the Lizard in Cornwall, two fishermen, George Vinicom and John Cox, also met a monster. Well, look, one steaming 30 miles off, 25 to 30 miles off, saw what I thought was an upturned boat on the, on the horizon. So we went over to investigate. When we got closer, we could see it wasn't an upturned boat. It was something that, well, neither of us have seen before. So it was dark in color, and had sort of humps on the back. I should say it was, well, between 15 and 18 feet in length, and rising above the sea about three feet. It was a flat, calm day. There was no disturbance in, on the sea at all. When we got up closer, got a little closer, I came astern, to our amazement, up out the water about three feet from this body, head, arrived, head appeared out the water. And it was a, well, thing I've never seen before after about 40 years of sea. And it gradually sank in the water and disappeared. But after talking about it, the only thing we could explain it was, a, was one of, very much like a prehistoric animal. The whole thing, I suppose, would have weighed, what, several tons. And equal in size, I should think, the boat we were in. Wouldn't you? The boat was 32 feet long. Although whales and many sea creatures occasionally come ashore, there seem to be few records of a stranded sea monster. One of the most celebrated, however, occurred in 1808 beneath the cliffs of the island of Stronsa in Orkney. 
Precise drawings were made of the Stronsa beast at the time, and its dimensions were carefully measured. More than 50 witnesses swore to what they had seen. Today, among the other exotic exhibits at the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh, is a piece of the backbone of the Stronsa beast. It's now in the care of Dr. Jeff Swinney. This was an animal which was described as being some 55 feet long. It was described as having a mane of hair running down the full length of the back, a tiny little head, a long neck, and many of the eyewitnesses, all the eyewitnesses who, who gave evidence on what they saw of this monster, quite reasonably interpreted this as being a totally new beast, a, a creature that they were completely unfamiliar with. Well, in the December of 1977, I was fortunate enough in being able to examine a beast which was stranded on the shore of the Tay near Carnoustie. These are the vertebrae of that animal, a basking shark. And I think the inevitable conclusion is that the animal which was stranded in Stronse, in the Orkneys, was a basking shark. What tends to happen when a basking shark dies and the carcass rots is that the cartilages which are supporting the snout here tend to drop away. So these go, the snout goes. The large area here, which contains the gill tissues, falls away. So all that lot goes. And what we're left with is a small skull in this region on and a long vertebra, long vertebral column here, which tends to give the appearance of a very small headed creature with a long neck. The fins tend to fray out. And in the case of a male, another set of what might appear to be limbs would be in this region here. And the lower lobe of the tail tends to fall away. So what we're left with is this small headed, long necked creature with this long tapering body. But a rotting basking shark certainly doesn't explain the beast with great teeth, and basking sharks are tiny, which came ashore, also in Scotland, at Gourock on the River Clyde in 1942. Being wartime, the Royal Navy wouldn't permit photographs. And finally, the beast was taken to the grounds of the municipal incinerator. On the orders of the borough surveyor, Charles Rankin, it was chopped up and buried under what is now the football pitch of St Ninian's Roman Catholic Primary School, Gourock. Mr Rankin. I can't see that this uh, carcass was a, a rotting uh, basking shark. In the first place, uh, this animal uh, showed no signs of rotting. It was absolutely complete, unmarked. Uh, the monster uh, measured approximately 28 feet from the tip of the nose to the end of the tail. Uh, the body, as it lay on the ground, was approximately 5 to 6 feet deep. Uh, the body could be described as having three parts, uh, the body, the neck and the tail, and the neck and tail tapered very gradually away from the body. Uh, the animal had teeth. Uh, teeth about uh, perhaps that size and uh, on both jaws. Uh, in the stomach of the creature uh, was a small portion of what I took to be a seaman's jersey. It was an open knitted uh, portion uh, of some knitted material. And the other thing, uh, strangely enough, was the corner of what uh, is described, can be described as an old-fashioned tablecloth, just the corner, and it was complete with uh, tassels. The evidence for still unknown sea monsters is almost overwhelming. As for the great sea serpent, it too probably exists, except that it may not be a serpent, and there may be several different types of animal involved. The solution to this old mystery may come quite soon. At this moment, the two greatest powers on Earth are trying to develop sonar systems which will make the seas transparent so they can track each other's nuclear submarines. Those systems will locate the sea serpent if it exists. Indeed, at this moment, the evidence for its existence may be somewhere in the Pentagon 
or the Kremlin. Next week, the extraordinary wisdom of the ancients. <laughs>